Okay, got it. And we can we can give Nick we can give Nick a, a lovely message, so he has to edit it out. <laughs> Hello, Nick. Hope you're having um, a lovely time wanna... up there. Yes, he's Fine. well. All the photographs are like he's having a lovely time, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, somebody must be taking them for him. <laughs> They're not on an angle, are they? <laughs> um, did you just want to try and share your screen really quickly, Dave? Just uh, I've, yep. I've got mine in, in the background, ready to go. Um, where are we? Yeah, that one. Awesome. There you go. Cool. I can see that. So if you want to take it off of share, um, then we'll we'll get everyone in and say hello to them. Are you good to go? Yeah, you can hear me okay. I can hear I can you hear okay. You perfectly. Excellent. Can you hear me Fantastic. okay? Yep. Perfect. Wonderful. Let's Here we make go, then. let's make the magic. Let's make the magic happen. <laughs> right, let's um where's the admit all button? There we go. Go here we go. Quite have so much. Hello, everybody. Oh, oh. <laughs> Pitch forms. Some this is at the beginning of this. This is why we leave. We let everybody keep their uh, their microphones on because it just gets amusing when we're listening to people's conversations in the background. Um, if you don't want us to hear your conversations, in the background, um, please feel free to put yourself on mute. Um, we do want to talk to you later, so that isn't a big problem if you do want to chat to us. But um, um, if you don't put yourself on mute when we do start talking, we will be putting you on mute anyway. Um, this is being recorded as well. Um, I know we haven't even done any introductions, but I thought I'd just get the housekeeping out of the way first of all. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Loads of new faces, Dave. Yep, lots of new ones. Hello there. Yep. How are you doing? Hi. Oh, and we've got, we got people on camera as well, so we can do waving and stuff. That's <laughs> really... Yeah, it might be an idea um, when we're sort of going through the presentation, if you want to turn your own um video stream off of yourself then that might help the uh, the old broadband or wi-fi or whatever just to uh, okay. keep up with what's going on just a just a suggestion but we, we like seeing you up until you do, do switch your camera yeah. off so um you know we, <laughs> feels like there's real humans behind the uh, the blank screens yeah yeah wonderful wonderful is it, and, and obviously we, we have got people on not on camera which is absolutely fine but is that for those people who are on camera is this um is this your first webinar with us has anyone have we got any first timers yeah oh, lots of first timers lots that's what we like time. wonderful you're in for a treat we hope. <laughs> um for those Don't of you who are hoping <laughs> For those of you who are hoping to see Nick Mariner's happy, smiley face, um, <laughs> he's even more happy, smiley because he's in Orkney or Isla. Sky. Or... Where is he, Dave? Isla. 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 He's, yeah. up, he's, he's up north. Um, those of you in the uh, WhatsApp group will have been, um, it's, it's an early birding term for you here. We're all being gripped off. Um, it's not as rude as it sounds. It's a, a Twitter's terminology when someone else is seeing some really cool birds uh, and we're not, because we're, we're in the middle of the country, wherever that might be. So okay. we're just going to give everyone another couple of minutes. Um, I think we'll kick off at five past, Dave. Is that all right? Absolutely. I've had a couple of uh, apologies um, come through. No problem. I'm just gonna I'm gonna dump the dump. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna carefully place um, <laughs> the invite link into the tracking the impact. Uh, so just in case people, uh, we are uh, and also um, in the bird skills as well. <laughs> Okay. There we go. That's just wasted another minute. Brilliant. Right. So, okay. Um, Dave. 
I reckon yep. we're, we're, we're good to go if you would like to kick off the introductions. Okay, I'm going to um, share my screen and put the first slide up. Um, just to say that um, we've got a, a fair number of slides to get through. We're going to whiz through them. Um, what we want to do, obviously, is to make the recording available um, <laughs> after the session once Nick is back. Um, so that might um, um, that might be sort of next week rather than um, this weekend. Um, but also, um, if anybody is uh, interested, then can make the the presentation available um, as a presentation file, um, which would include all the uh, sound files and, and pictures that we've got included, um, so that you can then play it back at your leisure uh, later on. Um, and then sort of uh, really hone your skills as, as to, in terms of calls and, and songs and so on. But um, welcome to the Species Identification Learning Sessions of 2023, um, kicking off the, uh, the Tracking the Impact um, season. Uh, we're actually starting uh, a month earlier um, than we have done before. And the sort of the reason for, for that is, um, is that Actually, as of yesterday, um, spring started and um, things are happening in the bird world. Um, for example, there was a, a couple of little ring plovers in the south. Um, there was an osprey today in Devon. Uh, black red starts have been uh, appearing on the south coast. Um, and then some of our winter visitors, such as Buick swans and uh, some of the geese are starting to uh, depart and, and move back to uh, their their breeding grounds um, as, as we speak. So March is <clears throat> obviously an interesting month when it comes to weather sometimes. Um, and that's what makes the, uh, the birding so much more exciting. But the, when it comes down to sort of the, the microcosm of, of our little patches or our little areas that we're going to be surveying, um, things, are, things are changing. Um, on an almost daily basis, and you can go to your you can go to your, your sites, you can go to your local patches, uh, and um, and see different things on, on a daily basis um, during the course of this month. And not only just seeing things, but also hearing things, and picking up on some of the new behaviours that that some of the birds are are, are, are taking that's taking place um, with them at the moment. For example, the red kites over me are are picking up sticks at the moment for their nests. Um, blue tits are investigating um, holes and crevices. Um, they're getting some of the, the, the chaffinches are beginning to, to sing a bit. And um, my black cat in, who's been attacking my feeder for the past month or so has now been joined by a, a second male. So uh, they're, they're obviously starting to fatten up, ready for their, uh, their return trip back to, uh, to Eastern Europe at some stage towards the end of this month, beginning of April. But anyway, the, um, the point of this is to learn a bit about, a little bit more about birding, um, to help you um, understand um, perhaps what to look for, um, what to think about when you're going and doing your, your surveys on your squares, um, but also to have some fun. Uh, and the more you know, um, probably the, 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 the better it gets in terms of being able to identify more and find more and, and, and actually have some fun. So I'm just going to move on. So welcome to, to everybody. Um, we have some veterans who have been here. This is probably their third season or maybe even the fourth. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's who's just joined us for, for this year. Um, whether you're, you're new and novice or new and experienced, um, you're all more than welcome. And a big thank you because you, you volunteered to take part in, in doing these surveys um, and maybe some of the, uh, the plant and butterfly surveys as well. Um, and, and as we all know, and Nick, Nick keeps reminding us that you know, these surveys are all around collecting and uh, reporting the data that, that, that we do collect, um, which makes it as, as effective as possible um, what we're myself and Simon are trying to want to do is to help you to be as effective as possible when you're doing those surveys and also to help you enjoy the activity more. So um, we're going to leave some time at the end 
um, to, for you to, to answer any questions. Um, so any questions that you've got, areas that you struggle with, um, topics that you want to discuss or so on, put them into the, the chat, book, chat box um, and we'll try and cover them during the session or we'll come back to you via one of the, uh, the various WhatsApp groups that we've, that we've got. Um, so this year's programme is slightly different as we grow with you and uh, we're taking on board feedback that we've had from, from previous years. So we're starting earlier in the year, as I say, um, and not only just to be able to um, experience more of what's going on at the moment, but also to give you as much time to absorb um, the learning and getting ready to hit the ground running when the, the actual um, survey visits need to be made um, starting next month. Now, obviously, March is a, a period when you can do the, uh, the recce visit, um, perhaps to plan out which route you want to take or just to get familiar, more familiar with the, uh, um, the route that you've got and um, to try and remember some, where you saw some of those species um, um, this time last year. We also would like to um, try and expand your event horizon. And what do I mean by that? It's um, not just think about the, the obvious birds that might appear on your patch or in your, your area, your survey area, but also to think about some of the ones that, that might appear. Um, and, you know, spring being spring, things can, uh, can appear, disappear, can fly over, and they can stay for a day, maybe even just an hour sometimes, just to feed up before they start moving on. But if they're, if they're something that you're in, is in your mindset that you might see, then um, if the chance does, does um, uh, appear, then uh, you're more likely to, to take advantage of it and recognize what you've got. We're also gonna look at more emphasis on, on flying birds. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, going through woodlands and going across um, fields and so on at this time of year, a lot of the birds um, can be sitting in the tops of trees. We can have flocks of birds sitting in tops of trees, little finches or small thrushes or whatever. And they could be sitting in the tops of beech trees and whatever about sort of 50, 60, 70, 80 feet high. And we'd like to sort of help you to be able to understand and identify what those little groups are um, as, as they're sitting in the tops of the trees, maybe calling, uh, and when they fly off, and uh, in terms of what to look for um, in what on what part of the bird to try and identify them as they go. So we're going to have five sets of these, these sessions. Um, culminating in um, a session, uh, or the, we're going to have five sets of infield sessions, um, the last of which is going to be at College Lake, and um, that's going to be a, a mini sort of bird race style thing um, between um, groups one and groups two, so it should be a lot of fun, um, no pressure at all, but um, group two, make sure that you're on top of the game by then. Um, the first two infield sessions, um, we're actually visiting the same area a month apart. Um, so one in March and one in one in April, which you know sort of would help to sort of open open eyes and understand what changes are happening in the countryside in terms of um, bird activity, um, what species are, are moving on, what species are beginning to take up territory, what's disappeared, what's come in, and so on and so forth, and, and what. What's happening with those in terms of song, in terms of call, behavior, display, and so on. So hopefully you'll find the, the sessions interesting. Um, and uh, before we get on to the actual birding piece itself, um, well aware of the time here. Um, just just some thoughts and reminders for when you when you are doing the surveys. Um, you know, bef before arriving and, and setting off on, on your walk. You know, have a, have a list of the potential species in your mind in terms of what might turn up. Um, have, have any ID, ID, ID aids to hand. Um, now, um, I don't know whether you all know of and use uh, the following, but there's the Merlin app, um, which is a free to use app um, downloaded from Cornell University, which is very, very good. It has bird packs for all different parts of the, uh, the world. It has one specifically for the British Isles, uh, and that includes um, pictures and includes sounds, um, as well as um, um, written descriptions in terms of the, the species. Um, 
There's the Collins app, which is based around the, the Collins Field Guide. Uh, that is a, uh, an app that you have to actually pay for. But again, it sort of mirrors exactly what's in the Collins app, but it means you can have it on your, your mobile phone. Makes it very portable and, and very useful. Equally, you could be using you know, Field Guide, you could be using a notebook, you could be using a camera um, to take photographs and then identify things when you get home. Um, nothing wrong with that, can be, can be very, very useful. And uh, can be extremely useful when you're looking at um, counting a, a flock of birds, for example. Um, counting birds is, is not a very easy thing to do. It's very easy to underestimate um, how many is in a flock, um, even when you've got um, uh, you know have a lot of experience of, um, uh, of trying, or trying to count some flocks of birds. When you when you've arrived, um, take some time to 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 stop and scan ahead. You know, if you're entering a, a field or you're entering a woodland, stop at the edge and just look and listen for two, three, four, five minutes. Um, consider where the birds might be, um, where some of the more um, uh, con conifer trees might be at this time of the year, where things like goldcrest and firecrest might be sheltering. Um, look at the tall trees around you, so there may be some flocks of birds in there. Look down the hedgerow, um, see if there's any obvious points in the hedgerow where you might expect to see um, yellow hammers or corn buntings or linnets or, or something like that. Um, and then also think about if you've visited the area before, what you've seen, where you last saw it when you walked the route, either from your recce visit to the area or from, from previous years. All very useful especially when it comes down to things like the scrub warblers, the garden warblers, the lesser white birch, black caps and so on. Because although they won't necessarily use the same nest year on year, they're going to be using the same um, set of bushes um, on, a, on an annual basis. Um, the more um, expert you get, um, try to do more without using your, your binoculars. Um, sound is very important, especially in, in woodland. Um, you can't see a lot of the birds, especially when the leaves are coming onto the trees. Um, and it can be as much as 80, 80 to 20 in terms of sound versus sight in the woodland. But obviously in other areas, you know, open fields and so on, um, when you've got something sitting in the middle of a field, you wanna make sure it's, uh, whether it's a clod of earth or whether it's a, um, a stone curly or something like that, and obviously the binoculars and telescopes do come into play. Um, and think about, you know, when you're, when you're doing your walk, if you, can, if you can hear something and identify it, you don't need to stop and see it. You can, you can put it down on your survey sheet and you can, you can carry on and concentrate on, on other, other elements that, or other birds um, that you're not so familiar with or, or actually looking at species that are, are showing themselves to you. Um, and also practice um, practice trying to identify small birds in flight by their jizz. Um, jizz is something that we covered last year. Um, it's it was taken from well, it was actually prior to the Second World War. Its first instigation. Basically, it relates to the general impression of size and shape, or G I S S. Um, but in the birding world, it's sort of become um, J-I-Z-Z. -Z. Um, and this is basically is everything about the bird. Um, the size, the shape, the way it flies, the way it moves, the way it hops, the way it walks, um, the patterning on it, um, literally everything. And each, of, each element of this uh, will add up to a unique um, not just species, but whether it's a male, whether it's an immature, whether it's a female, and, and so on. Um, so um, we'll try and uh, cover some of this on the infield sessions during the year. But please enjoy it. You know, if it's it's a bit cold at this time of year, take a flask with you. You know, have a stop on the way around. Just have a sit and a listen and enjoy what it is about the the English countryside that we all love. Um, um, Simon, um, you'll, uh, you'll no doubt um, push this very hard um, in, the, in the area of, that you're working. You know, it's, it, is, it is glorious being out there and, and sitting down and just listening to what's going on around you. And as we go through the spring, 
it'll just get um, it'll just get better and better. And every year and uh, every day is is, is different. Um, so you know, that's what makes it so much more interesting and, and exciting. So let's do some birding, Simon. Simon. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> right, I will. Uh... I will take over the screen in a moment. Um, brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for the introduction. Um, Dave and I are actually going to tag team tonight on the uh, on the identification elements. And as Dave has very articulately uh, articulated um, already, the um, uh, Dave and I got into this obviously from a hobby. Uh, perspective, but uh, we both do surveys, we both do uh, these ID workshops and, uh, and and field sessions as well. So, um, you know, our, our passion, our hobby um, has actually become a bit, a bit workify, but in a good way. And um, as Dave has said that, um, you know, we've uh, getting out there at the moment is just incredible. I've been doing winter bird surveys all the way from October. And um, yeah, it's it's <laughs> this last one in March is uh, is one of the warmest. I can assure you, uh, the February surveys that we're doing in Oxfordshire were were were, were blooming freezing. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully we'll have a a slightly warmer day um, on on Sunday for anyone who's in my group, and I believe I'm Group One, uh, and for Dave's group on Saturday. So um, what's good about that is you, you might have noticed there was a there was an air of um, was it competition wasn't it Dave there was an air of competition <laughs> in our bird race at the end. Um, what we enjoyed enjoyed last year was healthy competition, and what was always interesting was when one group went to a particular site, which obviously we both go to the same sites just on different days. Um, is that the the next group that goes is like right okay well we know that group one saw group two saw 28 we now got to get 29 so um but it can be as competitive or as not as you fit see fit uh we had um a, a lovely uh individual called mariki on that uh, on the um the sessions last year she was very competitive so um <laughs> but we'll keep it all uh, we'll keep it all nice and um it's about the birding and it's about having fun as uh, as dave said so I am going to kick off and I'm going to I'm going to show you some partridges and some waders. So that's going to be the first set. Um, we've deliberately chosen the birds you're about to see because we're still in that winter period. So, you know, you won't find well, there is one warbler, but it's right at the end. Uh, Dave's already <laughs> mentioned that, but you won't find the typical summer visitors. Now, when we deliver the next webinar in April, um, we will be talking about some of those summer visitors. Uh, we will be talking about the warblers and uh, and the uh, and dines and 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 those 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 lovely songs that you're going to be hearing. Now, although we've put some songs in today, um, it has only been in the last two weeks where the dunnocks have started to sing, the wrens have started to sing. So, why we will have you will listen. Uh, to some audio. The reason that we put them in there is so we can share the deck with you. So if you're sort of thinking, oh, I can't wait to listen to five minutes of Red Leg Partridge singing, um, you'll probably get about 10 seconds of it just to <laughs> familiarise yourself with it so that you think, oh, actually, I can learn that for next time. So I'm going to take you through partridges and waders. Uh, and then young Dave is going to, um, uh, oops, if I'm, I'll, I'll I clicked on the, the the thing by accident. Hold on a minute. Sorry. There we go. Um, and then Dave is going to be taking you through uh, the corvids after that. So here we go. You should now. I'm going to share the sound as well, so you get the benefit of the uh, red leg partridges. So you should see a screen there with two rather dumpy game birds. Now, um, what we've done is we've taken very obvious pictures. Um, and we've done that deliberately. If you see the partridges on Saturday and Sunday like this, we'll be incredibly amazed. What you tend to see is a little blur coming up out of the field and disappearing off over the hedge line. Um, you might know these two partridges by their old English name. So you've got English partridge on the right, which is the grey partridge, and you've got the French partridge on the left, uh, which is the red-legged partridge. Now, uh, the red leg partridge is an introduced species into the UK. Um, however, both of these birds get regularly reintroduced um, because they are released as part of the hunting 
fraternity, uh, similar to pheasants as well. So you suddenly, sometimes you'll you'll stumble across a, a covey, which is a group of, uh, of the, the grey partridges, which will come and run towards you because they've they've just been released. Um, we have the opportunity, I think, of seeing both of these at Bradman, if we're lucky. Um, both Dave and I will have telescopes with us as well. Um, and those of you with very acute hearing may just hear the red leg partridge. Always think it sounds a little bit like a dog barking. And again, those of you may, uh, with a very much better hearing than mine, you might be here to hear the grey partridge. They are quite distinctive, and when I can actually hear them, um, they are, <laughs> I can tell the difference, but uh, they, uh, if you, you, you really do need some young ears sometimes. Again, we will uh, we will share this deck with you so you're able to um, identify it. The biggest um, pointers here, that Dave has outlined here, the red leg has, funnily enough, red legs. Um, the grey partridge is, funnily enough, mostly grey. But you'll see that black belly patch is, is quite obvious if you get a really good view um, of the male grey partridge as well. The thing to note is that is that tail element. You see on the grey partridge on the left, it's got a grey tail with reddish out surrounds, whereas the grey partridge is a much more subdued bird. And you'll, you'll get more imagery on the wing, as you can see there. It's a lot more sort of speckled on the primaries and the secondaries. And if you see the red leg partridge and you see a really obvious flank markings, the flank is the side of the bird there. Um, uh, if you can really see them, that ten, nine times out of 10, you've got a red leg partridge on your hand. So that's the partridges. Um, and as I said, you got any questions at all? We're going too fast, too slow. Just drop them in the chat. Dave is, is like a, he's like a cobra coiled and ready to spring on any of your questions you have. So if you've got any questions about any of the species that we're talking about, please do let us know. The golden plover. Now, we're being, I, I think, Dave, I think we're being a bit ambitious on this one, but we, we put it in there, <laughs> didn't we? We're just hoping. We're hoping. We are hoping. So there are quite a lot of golden plovers um, in bucks. Um, uh, obviously, Bradnam is, is in mid-bucks. And golden plovers, this time of year, you'll see they're not in their more upland finery. They, they don't have that black belly, um, but they do have this sort of brown, golden, spangly um, sort of back. And what you'll do is you can see the feeding winter flock on the picture uh, on the right hand side there. That's typically what we'll see. Now, they're very hard to spot. I don't think we will see any in the fields at Bradenham, but you might just hear one flying over. Basically, when we're out on the field, I and Dave rely on you guys as our ears and eyes. What's that, Simon? What's that, Dave? Once once we've been alerted to it, we'll tell you what it is. So if you hear a little fluty song flying over and it's uh, quite a uh, quite fast wing beat, um, we may well have a, a little flock of golden plover. On our hands. The commoner cousin of the golden plover is the lapwing or peewit or green plover is, a, is another old English name for them. Um, probably quite familiar to most of you, uh, quite often seen in company with golden plover. Uh, if any of you are in the Milton Keynes area, uh, there's a lovely site called Passenham, which is just near Stony Stratford. And at the moment, there's probably about a thousand lapwings there and you get any, anywhere between 200 and 300 golden plover in there as well. Um, the, gold, the, the green plover is very aptly named. It's a green sheen on the back. And the, you're, they're moving from that adult winter plumage now. You can see that bottom left there. Don't get hung up on the plumages, but we, we put that in. Um, they're starting to come into their spring finery. And the uh, the lapwing or peewit has a wonderful call. And they're quite often seen displaying over farmland. Now we, again, 
at this time of the year they're still in those flocks and they're probably heading back to their breeding grounds um and we might we might be lucky enough to um uh, to see a lapwing at uh, random well, with that, I'm going to hand over to my erstwhile colleague who's going to take us through Corvids. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, be his glamorous assistant. So uh, once, he's, uh, once he's described and tells me to play the tune, I'll be playing the tune for you. <laughs> Over to you, Kate. <clears throat> OK, um, can you hear me OK? OK, so we're going to look at the, um, the Corvids. Um, so it's a, a group of birds that we're going to, we're going to encounter um, quite a lot in our, in our surveys. Um, we're going to start with the, the smallest of the group, the jackdaw, um, often seen wandering around in the local village, um, on the verges, looking for food at this time of the year. Um, but they're still roosting communally. Um, for example, Little Marlow Gravel Pit, um, there's probably about 1,600 to 2,000 that, um, that come in every night to roost in, on, on the island in the trees. Um, but as we go through March and, and towards April, then they'll start to uh, uh, start to be investigating your chimneys, and your outhouses, and uh, various other places where they can they can find somewhere to nest. Um, lovely, lovely little birds. Um, but it's lovely little black cap, um, white eye, uh, and the grey grey nape to the uh, to the to the head, um, and um, a quick call. Just to remind you, chat, 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 chat. Um, so it's quite a, quite an obvious call. Um, as I say, they, they do flock up when when you see them flying over. Obviously, you know if a blackbird is flying over your head, how high is it? Therefore, how big is it? Um, if you look at the jet door, um, it's got a very straight sided tail um, with very obvious um, corners to it. So it's quite a sharp corner um, that, that leads into the, uh, the curve of the, the end of the tail feathers. Um, and it, it's very, very sort of uh, very sort of gray on the underwing. So it's fairly uniform, but that sharp tail uh, demarcation, um, it can help you to uh, separate them from the the more untidy carrion crow um, and, the, and the raven and uh, also the rook. So moving on quickly. We'll move on to the rook. Now, this is um, when you see this well, um, and I think that the photograph versus the, uh, the drawing um, sort of says it all. You can see a rook in, in the sunshine close to, um, and absolutely glorious colours, uh, sort of some bronzes and some, some purples and um, so even some greens um, on the head. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, what to look for, yes, they, they do go around in flocks. Um, they do have a, a very different shaped head to the rest of the corvids, um, as shown there. And obviously they've got this, this much paler beak. Uh, and the actual paleness of the beak goes in and under the eye, uh, which is not something that, um, that happens on, on the rest of the, the corvid species. Now, it used to be true that the, in the old adage, country adage, was if you see one rook on its own, it's a crow. And if you see several crows together, they're rooks. But this doesn't, this doesn't seem to hold um, fast anymore because crows... In certainly in urban areas are rapidly moved into to forming flocks and even in the countryside now you can see a, a flock of crows especially at this time of year um, and um, so there's no there's no guarantee that one or many can be attributed straight away so focus on the um, the shape of the tail um, again it's it's sort of longer and it's much 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 more rounded um, the central tail feathers are much longer than the, the outer tail feathers, which gives it this much more rounded appearance. And they, their flight um, is much more sort of swoopy than, than, than the, the jackdaws. Um, they almost sort of like to play in the air. Um, and uh, you know, once, you, once you hear the call as well, then um, you know, that should help you to, uh, um, to identify them from either carrion crow or or the uh, or the jackdaw. So if you just play the call, Simon. So 
group. Quite often described as a core, quite harsh, quite harsh, but quite quite distinctive in, in that respect. Um, so moving on, um, we've got the, the carrion crow. Now this is the sort of like the, it's almost like a nothing bird in many respects. There's, there's, there's not a lot that's obvious about it. If you look at it, look at the picture there, the photograph, you know, it's got a black bill. Um, it's, got, it's a stout bill for sure. Um, its tail is sort of medium length. It's, it's, it's quite big, but it's all black. And there's nothing sort of, you know, not really much to sort of write home about particularly. Um, but in flight, um, what you'll see is the um, uh, a squarer tail, certainly than the rook, uh, and slightly more so than, than the jackdaw. Um, so that might help you in terms of um, if you can't differentiate the, the, the size between the, the various species. And there, there is, there's no glossiness. There's no different colours. It's, 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 well, um, it's fairly sort of um, middle of the road, if you like. And even the call is um, sort of fairly middle of the road as well. It's, it's, it's again, it's a, well, <laughs> what can you describe it as? It's, it's nothing exciting particularly, but having said that, you know, it's, an, it's a very highly intelligent, highly successful uh, species. And we'll be seeing plenty of them as we do every day. Um, so moving on to the, the next one, this is the, uh, I mean, this is the big boy of the group. Um, I went outside this afternoon as I got back from work, opened the back door, and one of these was uh, was flying over, cronking away. Um, and you know these these are getting more and more common um, around the Chilterns. Um, once you know the call and, and what to look for, um, you know we'll, we, you'll see them on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, we should see them uh, Bradenham this weekend. Um, even though this is the time of the year that they are starting to breed. And they're very early breeders, uh, much more, much earlier than the, uh, the, the rest of the, uh, you know, the core of the group. But what you, when you see one on the ground, I mean, it's look at the size of that head. It's, it's massive and the bill is just, it's just huge. Um, very, very heavy indeed. It's the size of a, of a buzzard. Um, Although it's against there, it's against a golden eagle in that particular picture. But um, they they are big birds. They've got very quite long legs when they they bounce around, and their tail is quite long too. And they've probably got the longest tail of, of all of the corvids. And they have very when it, when they fan it, it's very much a wedge shaped, diamond shaped tail, uh, as Simon's outlined there on the on the bottom right. So it's it's not rounded. It's 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 wedge shaped, and even if it's not um, splayed like that, it's a longer tail than any of the other uh, corvid species. And the head and the bill um, also protrude a lot more than on any of the other corvids. So if you've got a, a big black bird flying over, and it's 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 well extended front and back, then you've probably found yourself a raven, and then probably. It'll start um, start calling, and then you'll uh, you'll be in no doubt whatsoever um, as to what it is. Now that's not the that's not the only call they have. I mean, they do have sort of slight variations on it, but but it is pretty much a sort of a, a cronking call um, that they use when they're when they're flying over. Quite often they'll fly over in pairs, uh, but then so do so do carrion crows. Um, but they will uh, they they are more likely to engage in aerial acrobatics during display. Than any of the other corvid species, so they'll flip onto their backs, they'll roll over, they'll play, and and so on. So yeah, a cracking cracking bird to see. So yeah, if you if you're looking, if you've got a bird on the ground, a crow on the ground, the the, the things to focus on really is is the the head shape, the head coloration, and, and, the, and the size, as we see there. So that's your that's your crows. 
Um, and now I think we're moving on to you. I'm going to take you through the thrushes now. Thank thrushes, you, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the one I, I love about the raven, and, and you might hear um, Dave and I sort of emulate it when we hear it, is uh, almost every bird, or as soon as a raven flies over, you go cronk, cronk. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a lovely sound, but yeah, hopefully we'll is, see that at uh, Radenham. So I'm I'm going to take you through the next five species. These are a thrush family, and um, uh, I, Dave's already done some annotations on these one. It was uh, quite that, that's what prompted <laughs> me to do some annotations on the previous one. So uh, um, it's great because these are already built in on on these slides. So we're not going to spend too long on the blackbird. Hopefully, most of you will uh, will see these in your gardens. Um, and uh, what 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 Dave's sort of started to highlight here is. When you're looking at the thrushes, particularly ones flying over, they, they're all very distinct and unique flights, um, particularly around the tail, the size. Uh, and as we go through, you'll, you'll start to appreciate that. Um, male blackbirds are black. Uh, female blackbirds are that sort of browny sort of stage. The problem is the first year blackbirds, which we'll probably see a few of as well, sort of go between browny and blacky at the moment sort of thing. Um, we might hear some blackbirds on uh, on Saturday and Sunday, and we're not going to spend too long on these court songs because um, we're going to spend a lot more time um, on them when we uh, when we come back on the April session. But um, blackbirds tend to be quite melodic. Um, they're the ones that have that really staccato rattling alarm calls, but. Um, well, uh, we, we should hear one on uh, on platinum because the uh, the dawn chorus is certainly for the for the thrushes uh, is uh, has certainly started to arrive once we've um, once that spring once they've realised it's uh, it's spring. Um, the next one that we are going to be looking at is song thrush. Song thrush again. Some of you might have in your gardens. Um, we've highlighted the one in flight there because. Um, that again each of the each of these birds will have different underwing patterns when you start to get into the four non-blackbird thrushes that we're going to be looking at and as you can see there song thrushes have that sort of rusty buff um underwing and um they've got that very speckly sort of front but you can see they're quite buff um on that front not buff as in you know fit sexy looking thrushes although i'm sure they are but that sort of buff colored um that they've got there um even though we've highlighted the uh, the underwing, what we'll probably see mostly of the song thrushes as we're walking around Bradenham is we'll probably they'll come up from ditches or they'll come out of hedgerows. And what we'll probably see is this, this brown bird sort of flying away from us. But if we are lucky enough to see one uh, flying over us, it, uh, we should be able to see. Um, the song thrush hopefully will be very familiar to a few of you. Um, beautiful song. The key thing to remember between song thrush and blackbird is that repetitiveness, repetition, repetition. By the end of the surveys, you are going to know song thrush song. It's a very close cousin is the missile thrush. And uh, the missile thrush tends to be probably about 25, 30% bigger uh, overall size than the song thrush. You can see there on that picture on the right, um, it's a bigger, brighter, whiter thrush. And as you can see from the underwing, it's brilliant white. Uh, the speckling is more speckly and, um, and that's on a much colder uh, looking bird as well. Um, what we'll probably see at Bradenham is one hopping around, very similar to this. Um, they're quite upright when they're hopping around. Uh, and again, they'll look, they'll look quite substantial. Um, they have, we, we've put in the call of the missile thrush because it's really cool. Um, but the song from the missile thrush, you might think that sounds a bit like a blackbird. Yeah, sounds a bit like a song thrush. Yeah. The subtlety of missile thrush is that quite often birders will be hearing a missile thrush for about three or four minutes and then it will suddenly come into sound that you're hearing the missile thrush. It's a very subtle one. I always think it, it is actually a bit of a mix between blackbird and song thrush. It's got that sort of melodic tone, but it's actually quite a low, um, a low tone one. But we'll hopefully hear tomorrow, if we can actually get that song, is the missile thrush call. 
Sorry. <laughs> and that's typically delivered once they um oh, oh it's, all, it's all gone horribly wrong now. <laughs> um, I can't seem to stop. Wait, what's going on? Oh, the finger poking. Oh, there we go. Right. Um, let me see if I can move it on the. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, because it's not got the. Um... Oh. Stop. Right. See if I can move the next slide about. Oh. I tell you what, we'll we'll let the missile thrust sort of play out in the background. Um, the problem is the embedded file uh, for the missile flush um, hasn't got the the um, you'll keep seeing the thing that appears below it. So we'll let the we'll let the missile flush continue to sink. So what we might see still because of its winter visitor presence um, is the field fair. The field fair is if you if you liken the two winter flushes um, to our common missile flush and song flush, um, the field fair is more like the missile flush. So it's got that sort of um, that sort of size and shape around it. But as you can see, very different, very sort of warm, buffy on the front, and that grey nape as well. And it's also got a grey um, uh, rump, which is very obvious uh, in flight as well. So um, we should see some uh, some field fare tomorrow, and we might even hear some cold, a much lower sort of much much softer than the staccato missile flush but it's again it's got that sort of um uh and there's the missile flush kicking in behind us as well <laughs> um and then our last flush you'll be pleased to know if we can finally stop those missile flushes shutting up um is the red wing now again it does exactly what it says on the tin oh my goodness I I'm going to unembed them in a minute. Um, we've got the uh, we've got the red wing, and its under wing is is clearly red. I've got no idea how to spot that, Dave. Um, um, still, it makes for a good session, doesn't it? We're, we're just serenaded by a staccato of missile flop. Um, the red wing is another winter visitor. They'll be starting to depart in uh, in about sort of three or four weeks' time. Um, and they, the clue is in the question. It's got a big red underwing, and it's uh, got a sli slightly browner, more darker brown uh, feel around it than the, uh, the song thrush. Now, if you can hear the red wing over over the sound of the missile thrush, um, you probably can't actually, because there's, there's a real subtleness to red wing, um, which you really need to hear on its own without a missile thrush. Um, it must stop soon, surely, unless it's on just the page. There's a deep, deep of the red wing. Right, let's see if moving on. Go, yes, yes. I'm, I'm go, go back, go to, back go to the uh, missile flash and stop it. See if you can stop it. No, it doesn't seem to want to do that. Does it? There you go. Well done. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. All good. Well, you can play the red wing right. now. There we go. So you should all be really familiar now with missile thrush, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, especially if they're calling uh, around your around your head like that. So there we've got the five thrush species that we we should see at Bradenham. And looking at this picture now, you'll be thinking, oh, they're really easy, aren't they? But when you're out there in the field and there's birds flying left, right, and centre. You'd be thinking, right, well, what, what do I need to be looking out for? If it's got a bit of red on it, it'll be a red wing. If it's got a grey rump and a grey head, field fair. If it's brown backs with no red, it's going to be missile thrush or song thrush. Is it big? Probably a missile thrush. Is it small? Probably a song thrush. Is it warm brown? It's more likely to be a song thrush. If it's making a huge alarm call and flying away from you very rapidly, it's very likely to be a blackbird. But Dave and I will take you through all of the subtleties uh, of all of these thrushes when we see them. Dave, I am handing the reins back to you. You're going to take us through finches. OK, I'm just answering a quick question. That's quite all right. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry. Um, OK, finches. Um, just just going back to the, um, the, the thrushes, if you can just go back one slide temporarily, Simon. So <clears throat> of, of these five species um 
at this time of the year, red wing and field fair are going to be the birds that you're going to see in flocks. Song thrushes will be um, individually or in pairs underneath bushes coming out into fields to field edges to, to feed. Blackbirds will be sort of starting to pair up um, and um, looking for, for um, territorial, having territorial disputes and so on. Missile thrush is much more a bird of the sort of the open parkland and, and open, <coughs> open areas. Um, and they'll be sort of fairly sort of singular or in pairs. But field fairs and red wings are the ones that we might see perched in the top of a bunch of trees somewhere in the distance. Um, and then we can start to try and use some of our, our skills to try and identify which, which groups they are, because they are, they are quite different, but they do, they do mix as well. So you, you might see both species in the, in the same group. Um, so we might get some comparisons as well. Thanks, Simon. Next slide, please. Okay, finches. Um, we've got uh, sort of five or six finches. We're not going to uh, spend a lot of time on, on all of them. Um, <clears throat> but needless to say, um, the chaffinch is the most, um, most common of the, uh, the finches that we're likely to see. Get them in the gardens, get them in the feeders, uh, get them in the countryside, you know, you get them in, in most places. Um, you should all be relatively familiar with them. Um, but the song is fairly uh, fairly simple. Um, if you could play that just the once, that would be great. Simon, have we gone to lie down? So a very, very simple type of song. Um, but the, the, the bit I want to sort of focus on is, and going back to the, the introduction um, piece, was uh, talking about sort of the birds in flight and when you get um, small groups of finches flying over is, is what to look for. And the, the, the circled um, drawing there sort of highlights the, uh, the key things to, to look for. So you've got uh, a chaffinch tail, um, medium sort of length, not, uh, not doesn't have a deep fork in it, um, but it has very obvious white sides, and um, most of the rest of the the inner part of the the tail is uh, is uh, very black um, and not see through at all. Um, looking at the wings, you've got these the the wing bar, and then you've also got the four wing patch. Um, now both of those, um, you, if you look up, you're looking up. Uh, vertically and a bird flies over, you might well see um, through the wing, through the, uh, the wing bar itself, but the, uh, because the wing patch is on top of the, uh, um, the feathers that, that surround the, uh, the, the forewing with all the coverts and all the muscles and everything else, you, you wouldn't be able to see that from, from underneath. So just bear that in mind. So a bird with a, a long, thin white wing bar and white outer tail feathers from underneath is, is going to be a chaffinch. Thank you. Next one, please. Um, here we have the goldfinch. So um, again, another common garden bird. Um, things to look for here in terms of, of flight are the fact that the tail is more forked than the chaffinch. Um, it has more white in the tail rather than on the edge of the tail. So you can see where um, Simon's showing the, uh, the, the pen mark there. It's almost got sort of like two white patches that, that come in from the, the edge of the tail towards the, uh, towards the center. And on the, uh, the wing, then you've got this really wide, uh, really long, um, bright yellow wing bar. And this can be seen from above and it can also be seen from, from below. So it makes it a, a very, very easy um, species to, uh, to separate from the, the rest of the finches that you're likely to see. And, and, and this, and this um, stands up even in, if the light's not, not, uh, not very good. Um, but they are very, uh, very transparent, these, these wing bars. Um, obviously, you, you, you know the, uh, the call. Um, and again, you know, these, this is a bird that will flock up at this time of the year. Um, you'll get flocks of them in the countryside and moving around. 
Oh. What a lovely bird. There's nothing like a, a flock of goldfinches flying around like, uh, to make you feel happy. Next one is the, the green finch. Now, um, a lovely male, adult male, um, summer green finch is a, is a, is a beautiful bird. With beautiful greens and yellows and yellowy greens as well. Um, but equally, the females are quite um, brown, plain. Uh, the immatures are even more so. Um, once they've come out of their initial streaky plumage, they become more like the females, but um, you know, it's even, even sort of more dowdy, if you like. But what is it about greenfinch that, that, that you can look at when they're in flight and, and help you to identify? The first thing is, is their shape. Um, they are very, very dumpy birds. They've got a very pot belly uh, appearance. Um, they're quite wide as well. Um, and uh, they, they will invariably will go through the, uh, the, the, the call in, in a minute. Uh, they'll also have this wheezy call that will be uh, here. Um, and they don't have um, such an obvious wing bar as the chaffinch and, and the goldfinch. Um, they've got this um, outer webbing of the primaries is, is very yellow. Um, so that's not necessarily so easy to see from below. It's obviously easy to see from above, but it's a, it's a big patch rather than a, a wing bar. Um, so the key thing to look for um, when it comes to green finches is to look at the tail. And you can see there that they've got a, a, a bit of a forked tail, um, but they have these yellow patches on the, the base of the outer sides of the tail. Um, and again, those are visible from below and they make it much easier for you to be able to identify from below. Um, just, I'm not quite sure what we get in terms of the, the, the sound on this one. So that's the, the, that's the call, the wheeze. Um, so that's that's probably all we need to, to cover at the moment. That's the sort of the common common calls that you're going, you're going to hear from them. So that's green finch. Um, I think we've got um, bullfinch next, which we'll move on straight past because, um, again, we, we, we're not going to cover those too much. We're going to look at now at um, a couple of the, the winter finches um, that we might well see at, uh, at Bradenham and during the course of this month. And they do tend to, uh, uh, they can visit your gardens and visit your bird feeders. Um, and uh, also they can flock up and we can see them in the tops of trees and so on um, in the countryside. So this first one is the, the siskin. Um, it's a, a bit smaller finch than the, uh, than the chaffinch and the, uh, the goldfinch. Um, quite a, a sort of brightly coloured in, 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 in the summer. Um, but it does tend to be a bit more sort of dowdy at this time of the year, and it can be uh, um, it can be difficult to see some of the the, the brightness of the, the plumage that's shown there in the in the, the drawings. Um, so, what to do when you when you hear a siskin? Obviously, there's the uh, the sound that it makes, which we'll cover in a, in a minute. But this is, as I say, quite a small, dainty finch. It's got a quite a um, quite a, a, a a notch in the, the tail or a forked tail. Similar um, yellow markings on the tail to the green finch, but it's a much, as I say, it's a much slighter bird than the green finch. It's not, it's not dumpy, it's not large, it's not pot bellied at all. But also what it does have is these two, is the, uh, the yellow wing bar, um, in almost in some ways similar to the gold finch, but not nearly as extensive. And these these wing bars will again be visible from, from below. So a lovely little finch. Um, you do tend to get them near uh, alders. Um, they quite often feed on the alder seeds at this time of the year. And they, they can be unbelievably unnoticeable. So for a bird that looks like that in terms of color, they can be easily missed. These and red poles, they can be sitting 20 feet above you in an alder tree and just being, apart from making your flight call, as you're hearing now, which is again, is very different from any of the other um, um, finches. Um, you know, they, they, 
just try looking into some of the older trees that you pass by and, and see if there's any birds sitting in the top because they they'll quite happily just sit next to an alder cone um, and just sit there and munch on it for, for minutes on end um, and uh, very very inconspicuous but um, if you do see them they are a, a lovely little finch. Um, another little finch again which can flock up and can appear in alders as well um, and can mix with siskins as well is, is the red pole. Um, there's a lot of fun and games going on with um, how many different species of red pole there are. Um, nobody's sort of really made any, any concrete decisions. Things have changed over the, the various decades in terms of how many species there are. But the ones that we tend to get um, in the UK are the, the lesser red pole, which is the one at the top there on the, uh, the left, the cabaret, um, Cardiovagus cabaret. Um, that's the one that tends to occur in, in the UK. And it's quite a sort of a brownie dump. Not, it's, it's, it's a bit dumpy, but not, not big and dumpy. It's a small, this is a small finch, as small as the siskin, if not maybe slightly smaller at times. And again, quite inconspicuous. If you do get a, a nice view of one like the photographs um, below, then you can see this, this little red patch on the forehead. And also this very um, pointy, um, pale orangey bill, um, which is a, a good, distinct, good distinction um, for the species. Otherwise, um, slightly, uh, slightly notched tail in flight, but nothing obvious to look at. Um, it's 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 one of the, the the more difficult ones to see because it it is small and it could be quite high in the trees and so on. Um, the call is probably going to help you. And that's quite often um, what. Um, alerts you to the fact that there are red poles in, in the area in the first place. So, but a nice, a nice little bird um, and hopefully we might be able to, to see them. Finally, um, the linnet. So this is the, the finch, um, more of the, the open countryside, the one that we're going to see on hedgerows um, over the weekend and over the coming months. Um, probably not in their, their full summer finery just yet. Um, but beginning to, uh, to to move into that, and they'll be in pairs or uh, maybe small groups. And the best way to, um, to to describe them is that a couple of birds get off a hedgerow and fly about twenty yards ahead of you, and then stop. Um, then there's probably a couple of a uh, couple of linnets. And if you can see um, on the wing, um, there is a sort of a, a white patch, um, which um, Will, when they when the, the wings open, you'll see is on the the outer, uh, oh, sorry, on the inner um, wing, uh, and that's what sort of gives away the uh, the fact that these will be linnets, and the the linnet call, which is um, very distinctive. But not earth shattering. But we'll see these. Um, we'll see these at the weekend. Um, it's the, as I say, it's the common bird of the uh, the farmland uh, in this area. Um, so I think that's it for the finches, Simon. That's, that's the finches. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be taking you through the uh, through the tips now, very very quickly. And um, the uh, as I say, the reason we're we're sort of whizzing through this. This first session was always going to be a little bit of a uh, of a longer session because we really want to just take you through those commoner species that we're probably going to uh, encounter. Most of you are probably familiar with the great tit, and um, uh, if you're not familiar with the viewing of it, you might uh, you might have heard it. It's the one that goes teacher, 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 and what's happening at the moment is quite a lot of great tits are going teacher, teacher, teacher. Um, so we should be able to uh, get some really good views. Uh, of great tip. The key thing to remember here, and we'll look at the comparison at the end, is that uh, if we have that, um, uh, if we see a tip with this big black line down the front, you can see it here on the drawing as well, uh, with the yellow and this big black head with with a white with a white um, uh, cheek, 
that uh, that will potentially be a, a great tip. Um, the other more common species is whizzing through um, is the blue tit. Now the blue tit's call is a little bit more um, subtle um, than the uh, than the great tit, and I don't mean subtle in terms of the great tit tends to be really piercing, and sometimes the the blue tit call and also the blue tit song is um, uh, gets a little bit lost unless you're actually uh, listening for it, whereas the, uh, uh, the great tit tends to be a lot more piercing. But Dave and I will talk you through the, the subtleties of those calls. As you can see here, uh, although the male does have that little uh, sort of little line here, it's sometimes well hidden and uh, it certainly doesn't go up to the thing there. And the, the, the bright blue beret, I love that, I love that it's called that. Um, and significantly smaller than the great tit, probably about sort of 20, 30 percent as well. Um, hopefully you've recognised that from in your garden. Um, we've also got a whizzing ahead here, uh, long tail tit. We're going to see these at Bradenham as well. Um, the long tail tit is normally given away from its call. Um, <laughs> We should be able to hear that at this time of the year, very much like the thrushes Dave was talking about earlier, they do tend to flock together. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll probably walk down past a, a flock of long-tailed tits and then one will take off. You think you've been looking at one or two and then like seven uh, will all take off one after the other. Um, it's actually the smallest British bird. It's not the smallest British bird in terms of being recorded as well because that's the gold crest. Um, however, if you got rid of that tail, um, it's actually slightly smaller. Um, than a gold crest, but you can't really steal a long tail tit's tail because it wouldn't be a long tail tit at that point. Um, but yes, from a body mass size, it's 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 slightly smaller than the gold crest. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful little balls of fluff, and we should see them on Saturday and Sunday. We might hear colt it now. Um, I think last time, last visit, I think there were a couple in the churchyard. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the churchyard. Uh, and this one is not, is easily sort of differentiated because it's got this big white um, uh, sort of, it's the nape area, which is the back of the head, if you like, on a cold tit. It's got this sort of warm brown uh, underparts and then this sort of, this quite obvious white wing bar there as well. So hopefully, but again, what you tend to do with cold tits is you tend to hear them a lot, a lot more than you, uh, you see them. And it's that sort of wonderful, wizzy, wizzy, wizzy song. Normally delivered from pine trees, they're very much a, a tit of the uh, of the pine forest as well. Um, we might see marsh tit. Marsh tit is much the, the rarer of, of the tits that we will potentially encounter. We do include it here because we did see it in one of the, uh, one of the woodland walks we did last year. Um, but um, this time of year, there's again they, they're feeding in with the tit flocks and along the hedgerows. Um, they're they're sort of they're they're obvious by not being very obvious. So um, they they look a little bit like a cold tit. They've got any blue or green or anything on them, uh, but they've got this beautiful sort of black glossy cap here, um, and then they've got this sort of wonderful sort of white cheek with this little black bib as well. But um, we might be lucky. We might be lucky and uh, and get a marsh tip. But um, uh, again, if we're if we're lucky enough to hear one, um, I'm hoping that people in my group have got some good hearing. That's what we need this uh, this weekend um, because they do. They're quite a subtle one. But again, um, the whole idea of you having this this presentation uh, after the call is you can go at your leisure and um, listen to all of these calls um, just by fishing on the button. I recommend you not doing the uh, missile crush though, unless you've got uh, one earache for going through it. Um, <laughs> Dave has very kindly on this uh, on this slide done the most important thing around all of these tits, which is the head and head shape, head coloration for the most part. Um, because some of them have got black bibs, some of them have got blue, some of them are yellow. But ultimately, if you look at all of them, they're, they're quite obvious with their with their thing. And again, each one of these, if we're lucky enough to see them. Dave and I will take you through those finer points of, um, uh, and hopefully there won't be any confusion at all. Dave, back over to you for Dunnock. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll pass pass swiftly on through this one. We won't need we went. I wasn't planning on doing this or Robin or or Ren, but they're just in there for completeness and for anybody who wants to 
um, get the deck afterwards. So I think you probably um, know most of those. So um, one of the, uh, the birds, obviously, that, that we're going to be looking to record as, as much as possible during our, our sessions during the, the course of the spring is the Skylark. Um, we'll get to go to um, Lodge Hill, um, where there's, well, I think there's probably several, several hundred um, around at the moment, but we don't, we don't go there until it's sort of a bit later. Um, but we should, um, we should get some at the weekend. Um, if there's any game strips around the edge of the um, um, arable fields that we'll be walking around, then there's bound to be some, some Skylarks in there. So um, we won't dwell on it too long, but um, certainly one of the, the key indicator species that, uh, that Nick's very interested in uh, us recording. So, And again, a very uplifting song um, and just lovely to, to listen to, even if you can't see the thing hovering around in the, in the air while it's doing it. And uh, another bird that um, is, is around in the, uh, the open arable areas at the moment, um, certainly coming to the uh, winter feeders that Nick and his group have been putting out for the, uh, the birds to come into. Um, and again, hopefully, you know, we should, uh, we should get to see a few of these on the weekend. And this is the yellow hammer, um, a very beautiful bird the male is. Um, very, very bright yellow, even brighter than that drawing on the right um, potentially shows us. Um, sort of a contender for um, the linnet in terms of coming out of a hedgerow, flying along the hedgerow and then dropping back into it about 20, 30, 40, 50 yards further along. But this is what to listen to for. It's quite quiet. And again, as Simon says, we'll be relying on you guys to uh, um, to help us hear them, but uh, yeah, um, a good indicator species for the, the, the health of the, the animal farms in, in the area. And obviously the, the well-known little bit of bread and no cheese song. So we'll look forward to hearing that, yeah, but probably not, not, probably not this weekend. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to get a lot of action with yellow hammers, aren't we, over the spring? Yeah, I don't suppose there'll be too many singing this weekend, but um, um, once we get into April, then we should uh, should start to hear a bit more, which should be good. Just a very um, yeah, just a very quick question, Dave. Sorry, someone's just asked. I thought it would be better to talk about it. Is the size yeah. difference between skylarks and yellow hammers? What, uh, someone's asked what the sizes are. Did you want to just talk through the yeah. sizing elements? Yeah, uh, I, I think. Um, there's, there's probably a couple of things to, to think about alongside the, 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 the size elements. And one is <clears throat> the skylark is a bird of the ground and the field edges, uh, whereas the yellow hammer is, is more of a bird of the, the hedges and the copses um, around the fields itself. Um, so that's one thing to think about. But in terms of size, um, skylark's probably a little bit more sort of bulky in the body. Um, but with a shorter tail, whereas the yellow hammer is a bit, a bit slighter, but will tend to have the uh, will have a longer tail in, in terms of proportion to the uh, the skylark. But this is what the the infield sessions are all about. Um, come along, you know, and we'll we'll point out all of these differences when we when we get a good view of a, of one of the one or other of these species, or hopefully all of them. And um, you know, this is this is what we want to do is to to help you. Um, get to know these things intimately. Brilliant. Uh, so I'm just going to okay. take you through the last little set of um, woodpeckers, uh, and then Dave's going to Dave's going to romp us home with the <laughs> uh, with the outro. So uh, um, yeah, we're really hoping we're going to get a few of these woodpeckers. Now, obviously, um, um, we, uh, we we may not get as good a view <laughs> as the. Uh, as the green woodpecker there on the floor, but um, uh, I think we've pretty much ex um, experienced these on most of the uh, on most of the surveys that we did last year. You might be very familiar uh, with the old English name for green woodpecker. Which is a laughing call, which is why it was called the yaffle. Um, so uh, uh, very much a, a bird of the ground, 
uh, even though it's a woodpecker. I mean, they will fly to trees and you will see them creeping up and down trees, but they really like to feed on the um, on the ants uh, in the middle of fields and stuff. So, uh, yeah, the main elements to look out for here are particularly, well, it's, it's going to be a very, it's a largish bird. It's, um, it's, it's about the size of it or slightly bigger than the missile thrush. Um, so it's going to be quite a chunky uh, sort of bird. And it has this really sort of lovely green rump here that I'm sort of annotating on the screen. But it'll basically be a very green bird flying away from us typically. Um, but we'll probably have heard it call before it, uh, before it flies away. Uh, so that's the green woodpecker. Um, and then what we've got is the great spotted woodpecker. Now, again, Bradenham is a good site uh, for great spotted woodpecker uh, because of the churchyard and stuff there. Um, but what we'll probably do before we see one is we'll probably hear one drumming. Um, and uh, this is coming a much familiar uh, sort of sound again, uh, pretty much started up in the last couple of weeks, uh, typically against a dead bit of wood or a dead branch. Um, but some have found the metal covers on um, telegraph poles and so you can you can get different um different sounding drumming uh, depending on how hollow the uh the tree is or depending on um whether or not they're smacking a, a bit of uh, a bit of um, metal on the uh, on the thing um the obvious thing about the great spotted woodpecker especially in flight is the is the white on the wings um and especially when it's in a tree so again you can see this this big white sort of bar down here. Um, this red underneath the tail is really obvious as well when you see them well. And um, again, this little red spot at the back of the uh, back of the head. Now, uh, a little bit of birding insider knowledge there. Um, you can probably see from these drawings here. If it hasn't got red on the back of the head, it's a female bird. If it has red on the back of the head, it's a male bird. Now, young great spotted woodpeckers, which we won't be seeing, um, but they have a holy red there as well. So um, if we are lucky enough to see a uh, great spotted woodpecker in whatever guise that is, typically on the side of a tree, um, then if anyone gets some good views of it with their binoculars, we'll be able to age and uh, hopefully um, uh, define the sex for it as well. When you see them in flight, they're quite a biggish sort of... Uh, um, Bird, nowhere near as big as the green woodpecker, um, but they've got very broad, wide wings. And the key thing to note with great spotted woodpeckers is how they undulate in flight. So if we see a sort of medium sized bird, red, white and black, and it's going up and down, um, you can uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's a uh, it's a great spotted woodpecker. Now, I love the fact that Dave's put this last species in because um, <laughs> it's been very, uh, very adventurous. Um, and <laughs> if we get a <laughs> lesser spotted woodpecker, go on, Dave. No, the, re the, the reason that um, um, marsh tit and this species, lesser spotted woodpecker, are in, in the group um, has sort of raised awareness in terms of Bucks Bird Club are uh, very interested in, in the status of these two species within Buckinghamshire. So, um, not only are you helping with the, the BTO surveys and, and, and doing the surveys of your areas, you'll also be helping a specific, couple of specific surveys on, on marsh tits and, um, and lesser spotted woodpeckers. We probably won't we, see them. <laughs> we probably won't hear them, that. but it's, it's just, uh, again, it's part of your event horizon awareness. Yeah. And one of the good things that you might want to uh, so there's there's a, there's a few there's a couple of groups in the county at the moment in the north um there's been a, a lesser spotted woodpecker hunt and there's also one in the south now the south yep. of uh, buckinghamshire this is rather sorry if anyone's from oxfordshire or whatever um from buckinghamshire they've become a very very rare breeding bird uh, but they're still more commonly um, encountered in the south of the county um because actually uh, towards berkshire and um i think it's sorry actually there's still quite a, a remnant population whereas north of um sort of pretty much aylesbury Oxfordshire has lost quite a lot of lesser spots. Northamptonshire has uh, Buckinghamshire and Bedfordshire. So, um, yeah, if you if you if you if you are lucky enough to have a uh, have a plot um, down near um, uh, near South Bucks or in South Oxfordshire, um, what you might be listening out for is this. And you might be thinking that just sounds like the Great Spotted Woodpecker, <laughs> but it's. The way we liken this one is it's like sort of you've got one of those round rulers 
and you know you put it on the desk you just sort of in it's very short very sharp and it's sort of a, it's a, it's again a subtle more subtler drumming than the uh, great spot if you're on a survey and you're ever in doubt record the drumming chuck it into the chat and within about sort of uh, three or four minutes someone on the group whether it's myself or dave or mike or paul or nick will go that's a great spot or oh my goodness that's a lesser spot where are you so um don't be afraid to put anything into the whatsapp group because we'll um uh, we'll be able to um uh, sort that out for you and dave here we go your your last species and your favorite <laughs> my favorite and everybody who's who's been on the groups for the last couple of years this is this is your favorite this is the species that we all need to know and love dearly um so this is this is the only warbler we're covering um tonight so this is the uh, the black cap um it's a scrub warbler as as such um and it's increasingly common in winter um these days it's, it's increasingly coming to feeders love sunflower hearts and, and fat balls and things um and interestingly enough this the population that overwinters here um is the population that comes in from from eastern europe uh and this is something that's that started to happen over the last sort of 25 30 40 years um and it's now they are now um quite common um in in the uk in winter but this population that that's with us at the moment will depart um sometime during late march early april and be replaced by the the, the population that breeds here um that have wintered in africa and uh, have moved north to uh, to take advantage of the conditions here but this is this is the the, the one bird where you you need to know um, the song so we we will when we always do we always will concentrate on the song of the, the black cat and you can just sort of restart it simon that would be good so it's completely different from what we've heard so far tonight So it's got some it's got some scratchy bits it's got some rich bits um but one of the things it does have it has it has a, a, a phrase of five to six notes that it repeats in every song that it, that it gives and it's <clears throat> i mean it is a songbird um in terms of all the species we cover tonight it's you know it's, it's closest to the thrushes in terms of the fact that you know this is this is a song that it actually gives out um like the thrushes rather than um some of the sort of the wheezy things that, that tits and finches try and pretend to uh, um, to give out, but this is the one that that we'll be comparing: the lesser white throat, the white throat, and the garden warbler against as as we go through the spring. And this is the one bird that you will. This is the one warbler that you will hear um, during your your surveys. So this is the one that we will that we will focus on and um although it's not the, uh, the the smartest bird to look at um i mean it is it is a, it is a good singer and um yeah it's fun that um simon and myself we love the warblers especially the scrub warblers so uh, that's, that's the way it is um okay so that's pretty much it if there's any questions um fire them put them on to um the whatsapp group um otherwise we'll look for, oh i think there's one slide Simon, you need to show up. Um, yeah, I Saturday, was just, um, it was just in case it, I was just in case Sorry. anyone was rushing to ask us a, a question um <laughs> in the group. Um we were I was going to give people the opportunity to to ask us. We have got just literally two or three more slides, yeah. uh, some housekeeping that we've got, but I just thought it'd be nice to see everyone's faces, but everyone's off camera, so it doesn't really matter. Um if you so have you got a, a question. <laughs> or you feel that we haven't answered one of your questions correctly. I'm, I'm, I hope we have. 
um, but um, ask away. Uh, otherwise, we'll we'll just we'll just finish the last few slides, uh, which will be a bit of housekeeping. Um, so I'll just share the screen again. As uh, no, no one's no one's clamouring, Dave, to uh, to ask us any questions. So uh, oh, well, I think they've, they've probably been beaten to death. Slided to death. Uh, we've, go, we've got a great link I just put in there, which um, allows you to uh, download uh, the survey forms as well. But obviously, it's a not, not very exciting slide because that's for you to download when you get the uh, uh, the presentation. This is the most important one, isn't it, Dave? And as your first, um, did you want to uh, did did you want to talk about it? Because you might see Dave's influence on this slide. I don't know if anyone. <laughs> do you want to put this put it up in on the full, full screen? I've only got it on, um, it's only showing as a little corner at the moment. Okay, um, in that case, let me, um, let just me share me. again. I, I, yeah, I share it again, do... that'd be good. Oh, right, I've, right. I've got you. No, it's not, not for me anyway. I don't know what oh. anybody else is seeing. Um, uh, it might just me, be me. Let me try. Let me try. Try for a third time, otherwise you're going to have to share it. Um, so <laughs> I'll try. I'll share the PowerPoint. Let's see if that has a difference. Is that better? Not for me, no. I, I um, can see it. You can see it. Okay, that's fine. Well, it's fine. That's great. That's well, probably just me then. In which case, I'll whiz down to it. Um, so talking about the logistics for Saturday and Sunday. Um, so the fourth is top team two. Uh, which is, happens to be my team, and 5th of March is team one. Uh, so we're going to Bradnam, and um, the park, the car park is on the Bradnam to Walters Ash Road, and pretty much opposite the church. And uh, I've, I've put the, uh, the, the grid reference there on the slide. Uh, it's opposite the church, the space for um, probably seven or eight cars, but they'll, we'll be able to fit cars in elsewhere if, there, if there's more turn up. It's free. Um, but if you can share uh, a ride on the way, then that's fine. Um, so planning to kick off at 6.30, so if you can be there sort of by 6.15, then we can do the housekeeping, which is basically getting a, a list of emergency contact phone numbers um, from you all, just to make sure if anything happens, um, we know who to call. Um, and uh, please provide not your number, but... Um, um, uh, your other half's number or somebody that we can contact rather than phoning you up. Um, wrap up warm, forecast is dry, but it will be chilly to start with. So bring a flask or some, you know, some, some goodies to, uh, to eat on the way around to, uh, to keep us going. Um, obviously, we're not going to be rushing around. Um, there's plenty to, uh, to, to do and see, so we'll probably cover as it says there, probably cover two to three miles over three plus hours. Um, and there may be some sort of steepish slopes, but we're, we're not going to be hurrying. We're going to be taking our time and uh, enjoying the surroundings and um, uh, seeing some, some good birds. So I uh, look forward to seeing you either. Well, I'll be there on Saturday and Simon will be there on Sunday. So thanks very much for all your time tonight. And I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I say, look forward to to meeting up with you in person over the weekend. Um, I, know, I know Nick's mentioned it quite a lot, but if you <laughs> can't make Dave's session on Saturday, you can come to mine on Sunday. If you can't make mine on Sunday, you can go to Dave's on Saturday. The only thing that we would ask you to do is please, please let us know in the WhatsApp groups that you've been assigned to, because suddenly if everyone sort of thinks, oh, Dave's much nicer than that Simon chap, I'd rather go on Saturday and I suddenly get no one there on Sunday, I'm gonna be very sad. Um, but if you, if you do need to swap on any of our sessions, um, that option is there. That's why, because Dave and I used to do this on the same day um, in different locations, but we felt let's give you a little bit more flexibility. So yeah, if you do want to change at any time, um, just let either, well, let both of us know that you're coming off of one of them and going on to another one. And uh, we, look, uh, we look forward to welcoming you. Yep, very much so. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a good season. Exactly. See some of you on Sunday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
stop the recording.